Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and uh, thank you very much also for the opportunity to um, talk about where we are now um, and what's happening next on the Basin Plan. Uh, I might just want to start uh, with a few scene setting uh, sort of ideas of where we are, what it is actually in the Basin Plan, because there's um, uh, varying people have particular views on what they see as the most significant part, but it's actually quite a broad and complex um, reform and uh, series of activities. So I'll do a little bit of that and then talk through, uh, just give a helicopter view about what lies ahead, I think, for the next uh, seven years. If you want to talk about the beyond the seven years, Peter, very happy to do that, but we're getting into very speculative territory there, I think. Um, I think the, the first thing, I assume most of you are aware that the Basin Plan actually became law in November uh, last year and uh, it survived several disallowance motions in Parliament. Uh, the only motion that went to the uh, lower house, the House of Reps, um, was defeated 95 to 5. Now I want to emphasise this because I think this is actually has a lot of significance about the confidence we can have about the Basin Plan in the future. One of the key objectives of having a basin plan, aside from you know, its overall intent, is the rebalancing and in bringing together whole of basin management. But a key part of doing that was to get uh, certainty about the future. And that's the certainty that's essential for people to be able to invest, to have certainty that they're going to have a framework that's not going to be upset by uh, political upheavals from one election to the, to the next. So that bipartisan support uh, for the plan, uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty overwhelming majority, I think uh, really puts us in excellent uh, place for to have a, uh, a balance and proper transition as the plan gets implemented. Uh, the other sort of scene setting I would like to do, oh, oh sorry, I better... Um, just in case you're not aware, the basin is very big. Uh, but also, I thought uh, this, this sort of map sort of picks out sort of two key sort of features, I suppose. One is the scale of irrigation in the basin. That's, uh, that area is, is substantial. It's been massive, developed over a century or more, and uh, it's very significant. I mean, the basin river system is our most economically significant river system. We also have uh, very significant um, wetland and uh, environmental assets, species and wetlands, uh, some very significant areas up the north, uh, down the south around the Coorong and along the Murray River, significant areas up in the Macquarie marshes and so on. So it's, um, it's a big place, um, large irrigation development that has brought great wealth to the country and continues to do so and it is highly significant and well developed. Um, but uh, the rebalancing, I guess, that uh, Peter was talking about is, is where we are now. Um, uh, I feel a little bit nervous you're saying it's the beginning. Um, it's, uh, but certainly, you know, water reform, as people know, has been going on for many decades. But this time is really the first time that it's actually got to a point where it's, uh, um, the, the, the steps are being taken to try and get to that rebalancing. Um, the other key point in this graph, not that I've got the people there, uh, but there are many parties involved in that. Uh, we just, uh, Peter mentioned the states and the territories who are, are our collaborative partners in this work. Um, it's, they bear a large part of what has to be the implementation of the Basin Plan. There's significant new responsibilities for the Commonwealth and uh, for the authority uh, and also for the Commonwealth Department. And so it's, uh, it's very big for, for government. It's a significant in new endeavour. Uh, but there are, the partners in this are much wider than governments. They are our, uh, all the, the local governments, sorry, that's in government, but uh, sort of key collaborators outside state and, and federal. And uh, irrigating communities, uh, local government communities, as I mentioned, are significant. Um, the science community, uh, the irrigation community, the indigenous communities, and uh, the uh, environmental interests. 
Uh, so, you know, and I don't want to not exclude anyone, there are a lot of people involved in this who have uh, an interest in it working and working well and making sure that the key objectives that people have in the, in the basin are achieved. So I thought uh, it's probably worth uh, just briefly sort of stepping through what's in, what's in the plan before we start talking about how, where we see the implementation proceeding. Um, in this uh, document, this is the legislative instrument that was agreed, it's got uh, the key components uh, which I'll briefly sort of talk through here. The sustainable diversion limits is sort of one of the, the fundamental of the, sort of the big idea, so to speak, out of the, uh, the basin plan and out of the initial conception of the, uh, the Water Act that uh, addressing the issues that have been raised since the COAG 1995 reforms and the NWI of over allocation, um, this is the place where the rubber hits the road and in setting what those limits are. And this has been, as most people would know, the main focus of uh, attention over the last uh, couple of years. So setting that sort of been a, a significant part of um, what c what's in the plan. But the other parts of it, I, I would argue, are equally significant. Could they're about these changes to the governance arrangements going from um, state by state governance through to actual whole of basin focus on the, uh, the water resource planning and environmental watering. So water resource planning is uh, coordinated water resource planning is a key part of it. This will be undertaken um, by the states with uh, the support and uh, help as, as much as the authority can do and uh, also from uh, other collaborators to enable water resource plans that are developed in accordance with the settings of the basin plan. Now those are settings sort of the, the standards and the content of what goes into water resource plans. They're not settings of prescriptive detail, they're just settings on the key requirements of a, of a water resource plan. There's going to be a long period as those plans are developed over the, over the next uh, seven years and it's a key component of, uh, of the uh, plan. Environmental watering is relatively new, well, and very new compared to the development of irrigation over the last uh, century or more. And uh, so where with irrigation, things have been well developed and um, understood, and uh, people have a very good understanding of how um, the irrigation system works and what they need for their crops, and there's been a long history of continual innovation and development. With environmental watering, uh, really, I suppose the sort of first, uh, there's some tentative um, environmental waterings in the 80s, if I can recall, but the biggest one has been the Living Murray, which really only got its portfolio together in the last, um, in the last few years, so that's 500 gigalitres. There's now an additional 1,500 gigalitres that have come, that's what the uh, Commonwealth Environmental Water ha Holder has now, and the process of developing the plan for environmental watering is going to be a, um, a very adaptive process. So that's a key component. It's, uh, it's very uh, new in environmental, in uh, water resource planning, and it's going to be a critical focus on doing it and doing it right and continually improving that over the next period. Water quality and salinity. Uh, that is, it's actually been reasonably well developed over many decades. We've had a basin salinity strategy that's been around for I think about 15 years, don't quote me on that. Uh, and it's uh, been uh, sort of well established and an early intervention into managing some of the environmental problems in the basin uh, in the last uh, couple of few decades. I mean, I think actually salinity was emerging um, uh, in the first part of last century, um, but really came into focus in about the 70s and 80s. So that's, this really puts in the overall framework for water quality and salinity, drawing very heavily on the, the work that's already been done. The trading rules. The trading rules are, are new rules that are all about fairness, the fair, uh, fair rules for all players um, that are coming into uh, play in uh, in, during the period of the basin plan implementation. Critical human water needs, uh, I don't know how many of you can remember the dire situation in the drought where um, water sharing arrangements between states had to change 
just to, um, uh, in a temporary way, to meet those critical situation with towns running out of water and looking down the down into a future where there was not going to be enough water to supply basic needs um, unless there was some significant change in the weather. That was a very crucial time and a lot of the rules for how you move into managing critical human water needs were brokered during that time. These are now sort of in, enshrined in legislation that um, uh, all states agree to. This was a key referral actually from the states to the Commonwealth because it's not, no, it's not constitutionally a Commonwealth responsibility. Uh, but these, uh, this was such a sort of critical national importance to make sure we had arrangements in place to deal with um, severe drought situations was why that was included. So that's just a very, very rough, <laughs> quick overview of what's in this document, which is the, um, the legislative instrument, regulatory uh, piece of work. But the plan is broader than that, the basin plan, and the, um, the, the sort of companion piece, so to speak, is uh, how the environmental water is, is recovered. How do you get to that rebalancing? And this as well as was a key sort of focus of discussion in the, uh, in the development of the basin plan, how that was done. There's two sort of key ways, I guess you could say. Uh, it's sort of probably more complex than that, and there's many programs with acronyms uh, that um, I will put you to sleep at night. But um, there are sort of the key, two key ways are modernising irrigation and on the on-farm, which is a major infrastructure development. Whoop, I haven't... Uh, ten minutes? Great. OK, um, which is both the sort of the major trunk developments on farm and the off farm water efficiencies. And uh, there's been uh, for the program at the moment five point eight billion dollars investment into this. This is probably one of the biggest investments into building uh, rural and regional um, development, I'd say, and, and upgrading that uh, the chance to upgrade that industry and put them on a sustainable footing for the, for the future, bigger than uh, um, anything else I can think of. Uh, bigger than many of the forestry industry ones, bigger than the fisheries. It's been a substantial investment and I think very significant um, to have both the certainty of the plan and that investment in um, building the sustainable future for those industries. Water purchasing. Um, this has had a lot of discussion. I won't go into any, any detail here. These, both these programs are run by the Commonwealth uh, Department of Environment, so I don't want to speak for them. Uh, but there's sort of the key er uh, points on that is one, that it's voluntary, and um, it's uh, always been the case that it's voluntary and there's no compulsory acquisition. Um, and it uh, seems unusual to keep saying this, but it's surprising how many people haven't uh, uh, feel still concerned that that isn't the case. Um, it's always been open market, those voluntary purposes, and as you know, there's, there's been a number of rounds over the last several years. And it's also, um, there's some targeted programs, quite a few targeted programs have been developed, including one recently announced by Minister Burke a couple of months ago. The other part of the plan, and I think uh, this is sort of really one of the most uh, exciting and interesting um, areas, is uh, the, the various activities that are underway to get more efficient water management. Or well, efficient and effective is probably a better way of saying it. The, uh, there's a significant program of work uh, that's been underway for some time. Um, the Commonwealth put in 10 million a couple of years ago to help states develop um, uh, new environmental works and measures that may be able to uh, achieve environmental outcomes with less water. Uh, and uh, it's been uh, sort of on under development for some time and there's been a few um, early sort of feasibility studies done on those, but this uh, plan now gives the opportunity for those to come to the fore. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other one, is, I've called it a river operations review. We don't actually have something like that, but under the but there is a program of work to look at the um, the various rules of the river, the operation rules, which um, feel uh, you know can fill some a few solid books, 
um, how some of those rules might be able to be modified to enable environmental watering to be uh, delivered more efficiently and effectively. And that means the more efficiently you can deliver the water with policy changes and rule changes, um, the less water you're going to need to be able to achieve the same outcomes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very important part of the work. Constraints management. I think uh, that's a picture of a bridge, which is a constraint of a sort. Um, that has been, uh, and uh, you know, the, the risk to third parties um, are the, the key issues that need to be looked through to see how that can be modified in ways that enable more environmental watering more effectively, um, but doing it in ways that uh, avoid any third party impact. So it's a substantial piece of work, but it's the sort of work that needs to be done if you're actually going to get effective outcomes. The way a lot of these are all going to come together is in a one-off process uh, which has got the name of SDL adjustment. So basically it's a process of adjusting the limits that have been set under the plan and um, modifying those uh, you know, where it can be shown you can get uh, the same outcomes for uh, less water and bringing into bear the constraints um, strategies to enable that water to be used effectively. So it's a one-off thing. The next three years are going to be uh, pulling together the projects to do that. And uh, in 2016, that'll be the date on which um, uh, adjustments are going to be proposed to the minister. And uh, he then tables it in parliament. So i better move pretty quickly on the implementation. Um, I've only highlighted in this scene a, uh, some of the key points that of um, development along the way. Um, this year uh, we have, I've just picked out two things that are probably significant. It's going to be the first time we'll do annual environmental water priorities. This will happen every year, but this year in June will be the first time we'll need to pull together basin plan environmental watering priorities. Uh, and at the end of this year will be the constraints management strategy I was talking about. Now the constraints management strategy, at this point it's a strategy, nothing will change, no rules will change. It's the overall strategy about where the most promising uh, prospects are and uh, what the sort of benefit costs of those are. It's up to governments to make decisions on what, uh, the, what rules would change and what measures they want to pursue. 2014 is when the trading rules will start. Uh, by 2014 as well, we'll have a basin watering strategy, which is an overall strategy for how, about you, how you go about the environmental watering, some of the key techniques, and how you do that to focus on the priorities on a basin-wide scale. So it's a sort of a long-term approach with the key strategies, um, and it helps uh, and sets the framework really for the uh, states' long-term environmental watering plans, which uh, are going to be developed the following year. Um, along the way, uh, the state water resource plans will be developed, as I described before, and the infrastructure in investment, the investment in um, on-farm and off-farm uh, infrastructure and the investments in any environmental works and measures that are agreed will be occurring sort of uh, along the way as we get to 2019, which is the date when the SDLs actually come into effect. So there's lots of things under the plan that are going to be happening now. Uh, oh, sorry, happening in that seven-year uh, period, but it's the compliance on the SDLs, and this has been a critical decision to enable this transition period, will not occur till 2019. And at the same time, the state water plans accredited in accordance with the basin plan will um, be in place. But it's not all set in stone, and I think when I was talking about the efficient watering management and the continual adaptation we're going to need to have with environmental watering, there are a lot of sort of review points and adaptation opportunities along the way. I've just picked out some key ones here. Um, in the next uh, year or so, hopefully sooner than that, there's three groundwater reviews that we agreed to do with the states. They'll be underway, two in New South Wales and one in Victoria. Um, as well as that, we've been working with Queensland and New South Wales on a Northern Basin work program where they wanted the opportunity um, to review uh, the environmental watering requirements and to re-look at the science. It's a very um, well, less well-known area up in the north than it is in the south. 
and uh, so it was an opportunity that we were very keen to work with them on to get a much better understanding and so have an opportunity to run that program. We have a, a community advisory committee, a Northern Basin community committee that's made up of uh, local government and um, uh, irrigators and floodplain graziers and uh, uh, some very um, uh, effective uh, operators, I should say, uh, who, are, who are helping us uh, to shape that program and uh, ensure that it's sort of well supported across the, uh, the northern region. And that's an opportunity for um, if that work program shows that we need to review some of those northern uh, basin SDLs, that's the program that'll give us the opportunity to do that. Uh, there's the SDL adjustment, which I mentioned before, in 2016. So that's sort of the one-off uh, opportunity to see how the innovative measures that might be developed through the works and measures programs and the, uh, the rules um, review that can be brought into bear and, and modify the SDL. Then uh, in 2017, we've got a review of environmental watering strategies. So that's an opportunity to pick up the learning of how effectively we can do environmental watering, what needs to change at that point. Uh, similarly with the salinity and uh, water quality plan. Um, as well as that, the basin plan is actually reviewed every 10 years. Whether or not it needs to change is sort of up to the point of that review. So lastly, um, just to sort of talk about the continued collaboration, get back to my original point. There are um, many people who have a very strong interest in the outcomes for them personally, um, for their communities, say in the case of local governments, um, for their industries. There's some very strong committed people who represent their industries and want to have a strong future for an industry as well as the individual operators. There's a, a strong interest in the science community of wanting to have a, um, to ensure we have the best possible science brought in, into play as we uh, adapt and innovate during the process. Uh, there's environmental interests. Uh, many community organisations uh, want to see that, uh, you know, their, their interests are still kept to the fore in how the plan is rolled out, their involvement in decision making or sort of uh, consultation in uh, key things like the constraint strategy and environmental watering. And uh, we have uh, set up uh, advisory committees um, to give us the advice. I mentioned the Northern Basin Committee. We've also got a, a scientific committee. Um, not, they're not a decision-making committee. Uh, in fact, they're quite a sort of a high-level strategic group. Um, Bill uh, is on that committee until he's going to head off to India. Um, and uh, we also have our Basin Community Committee. But there are sort of peak committees, but the key activities, every activity we'll be doing is we want to work uh, in close collaboration and uh, consultation with the whole range of groups. So that's our mode of doing business, so to speak. So I just want to leave it at that point and um, leave our, if uh, you want to follow up on how to get involved, <coughs> we have our contact up on the website um, which will give you updates of all the, our usual day-to-day -day river operations and our um, and what we what's next in relation to the basin plan. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. <coughs>